Uh, thanks, Peter. I love working with Peter. It makes my head hurt. Um, so, I don't know about straightening the whole mess out, but um, I'm, I'm going to do what I'm comfortable in doing, which is, which is picking on economics. Um, I'm an economist. I was trained as an economist. Sometimes I hate to admit that, but that's where we're at. Um, so, I thought I'd talk a little bit about, to build from Peter's talk, about if you built an economics, as if science mattered, at the other end, which I thought is what I was signing up for when I started calling myself self an ecological economist, where, where we might get. So I, I need to, I know there's not a lot of folks who have suffered through micro or macroeconomic theory as I have um, in grad school. So I want to talk a little bit about what it is to be an economist, contrasting worldviews to build from Peter's talk, the promise of ecological economics, and then maybe sort of a search for some old old foundations for a new economics. So the first thing is to, to know is we have a superiority complex. Um, certainly when I look in the mirror, this is what I see. Um, uh, a much younger, thinner, um, brighter version of myself. My wife reminds me that it's not so true anymore. But um, And thankfully, uh, there's been some analysis on this by a sociologist from Berkeley, Marion Forcott, has talked about the superiority of economists in a recent article in a top-tier journal of economics, the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Um, we make more money. We have more influence on the established power structure than other social science sciences. I'm just going to bring this a little bit this way. Um, there's a forthcoming book coming out from the University of Chicago Press that, that does some analysis on this. 40% of the income of economic authors comes from consulting activities with business and government. If, you've, if you saw the movie, uh, The Inside Job, 2010 movie, you might get some perspective on, uh, on the power that economists have in modern society. Uh, we have less women. Um, if you look at some recent data on the percent of doctorates awarded to women in select disciplines, um, all of these disciplines are making some ground, uh, but economics and the physical sciences um, are still woefully behind. And Fort Codd and her colleagues note that as a consequence, quote, cross-disciplinary relations are inevitably permeated by broader patterns of gender difference, stratification, and inequality. Um, we are the most scientific, according to economists. Uh, this is a survey by a, a colleague at Middlebury College, David Collender, who found that 77% of economic graduates from elite programs, this top tier of economic programs, agree with the statement that economics is the most scientific of the social sciences, at least. And this will give you some sense of, of that superiority complex. An article um, in the Quarterly Journal of Economics about 15 years ago, the ascension of economics results from the fact that our discipline has a rigorous language that allows complicated concepts to be written in relatively simple abstract terms. The language permits economists to strip away complexity, all that stuff that Peter was talking about. Complexity may add to the richness of description, but it prevents the analyst from seeing what is essential. For example, um, some of you might be familiar with the work of Frank Ackerman. He wrote a beautiful article called Pricing the Priceless. And he provides me some examples of if you take economic logic and you just carefully, meticulously carry it forward, what kinds of conclusions you might reach in certain for certain questions. For example, he looked at uh, the work of Kip Viscusi at Harvard University, um, some work that he did in a National Bureau of Economic Research study on cigarette taxation and the social consequences of smoking. And the conclusion of the study was that states would save a lot of money if they encourage more smoking, and that we should subsidize smoking, not tax smoking. Because most of uh, health care is end of life care, and if people die sooner, then that's going to save us all kinds of cash. And the economic logic of the argument and the model built is impeccable. Um, Carlin and Sandy did a, did a study published in the Economic Journal, a top-tier journal in the field, on estimating the implicit value of a young child's life, where they went through and calculated this, this value by um, computing the, the time that a mother saves by fastening her children in a car seat correctly and came to the conclusion that the value of a young child's life is $500,000. Um, 
Here at the University of British Columbia, Colin Clark has done a remarkable amount of work around bioeconomics and natural resource economics. In the early 1970s, um, he showed, I, th I think quite convincingly, that the central model of profit maximization in the economic model would logically, inevitably, and if you follow the principles to the T, lead to the extinction of animal species, especially those slow-growing animal species like whales who just uh, doesn't, doesn't pay to keep them around. So the, the superiority of economists kind of comes from this world view, and Foucault and her colleagues unpack this a bit to get into the secret of this superiority and the secret of the dominance of economics as a field certainly within the social sciences, certainly within higher education, and certainly within the modern power st structures of society. There's a certain insularity from within, without, and a hierarchy from within. Um, the very stable prestige rankings of the top economic departments, um, and they exchange sort of students amongst each other than, any, than higher proportions of any other fields. Um, Economists tend to uh, disagree with statements such as, in general, interdisciplinary knowledge is better than knowledge obtained by a single discipline. So as compared to other social science disciplines, even economics really stands out saying that um, we disagree with this. And they go on to, to show some really good data on how economists tend to cite other economists within the same journals of economists. So there's this kind of um, self-fulfilling prophecy of economics. I already mentioned that the higher demand for services uh, of, of this field, particularly from very powerful and wealthy parties, um, helps um, ascend economics to the, to the top of uh, the social sciences, the self-proclaimed queen of the social sciences. Um, there's very tight management of the discipline from, from the top down, and um, this is some analysis of that showing, for example, uh, which departments uh, contribute the most to the management of the American Economic Association, a dominant um, professional association within the field, comes from uh, all from the top 20 departments and most from the top five. And if you look at this historically, uh, that doesn't change all that much. So this self-confidence of economics has really led to a number of impacts. And I want to kind of get to a point of the story here to, to ask, you know, has, ec has ecological economics embraced this superiority complex? Have, have we embraced this self-confidence or have we um, tried to deflate it a bit? Um, economics has had a significant influence on other social sciences, management in particular, political science and finance, with growing influences on applied sciences, engineering, natural resource management, and an increasing influence on conservation biology. The extension of rational choice theory, as many of you know, to many social choice problems, this, this kind of uh, superiority complex of ec economists has meant that we can apply a very simple model of the scarcity principle, a very simple model of the cost-benefit principle to discrimination, crime, marriage, the work of Gary Becker, the Nobel Prize winner from the University of Chicago, and the explosion of popular books around so-called economic naturalism, using the economic worldview to describe everything. And an education of, you can fill in the blank, um, uh, brilliant mathematicians is maybe the one answer to um, other things. Um, if you look at economics and its influence on modern society, this is some data that I found looking at uh, these cohorts of the high school class of 72, 82, and 92. And you find that uh, e economic principles is a course that is in the top five behind freshman composition, psychology, physical education, <laughs> and then there's economics. Um, biology's up there, so that's good, but economics um, is a course, particularly introductory economics courses. Uh, and the most recent data I found found that about 40% of first year university students in North America so over one million students every year study mainstream economics at the introductory level. Um, so part of the mission of ecological economics can't be just to sort of teach this separate brand of economics and hope that it'll have an influence. It really is to reteach the whole edifice of economics. Most popular majors for post-secondary students 
Um, this is some recent data for the U.S., about 1.8 million bachelor's degrees conferred. Business, social sciences um, are the top, uh, where all of those students are taking introductory e economics, they're taking finance, they're taking um, at the master's degree, business and education. Um, some great work by Tom Green. Is Tom here? Where's Tom, Tom Green? Um, on looking at uh, how sustainability is taught within introductory economics textbooks. So if, if all of these students are taking it, and it's a dominant part of the sort of hierarchy of, of, of modern education, what's being taught on sustainability? And Tom can go into more detail on some of the work he's done on teasing out uh, the relatively low amount of sustainability that is found in modern textbooks. Um, and again, building from Tom's work, pulling out some of the, the themes that push against sustainability, that sustainability is often kind of a footnote in many of these textbooks, and the chapters that it's found in is often an optional chapter on the, on the syllabus of professors, so I'm, I'm not even quite sure that it's taught all that much. But it certainly perpetuates a narrative of unlimited wants, no distinction between necessities and luxuries, um, perpetuates a narrative that absolute limits to growth uh, are not relevant, um, perpetuates a narrative that growth in mankind's ingenuity has offset the effects of a larger population. So thanks, Tom, for pulling those quotes for me. Um, Princeton's review, right? All of our high school students, at least in the U.S., you know, they sit in the guidance counselor office and they pull open the Princeton Review and they say, I don't know what I'm going to study. What should I study? So the top ten recommended majors, Computer science, communications, government, political science, business, economics, biology is there, number 10. Um, but uh, the, this, these are in terms of majors, of, of what we're telling our students to take, which makes a lot of sense, right? You gotta go out and be part of the modern world and these are, these are good things to learn if you wanna make money and be a consumer and not a citizen. Um, five classes every college student should take no matter what your major, and this is from USA Today from 2014. Number one, finance, accounting, business management, communication, history, so no, no science whatsoever. Um, this self-confidence of economics has led to, as I've said, a significant influence on other social sciences, an extension of rational choice theory to about any kind of human behavior you can imagine, Ed education of generations of, I, I don't know, my word, my, my fill in the blank would be magic, magical thinkers. Um, the social acceptance, though, of an economic worldview is, is, is probably the biggest take-home point, right? Um, what is that economic worldview? It's not that economists have nothing to offer, it's just that um, economic thinking is dominating kind of uh, a, 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 a worldview that is in direct conflict with um, living well in the Anthropocene. So just a few characteristics of this worldview. Certainly, as I think Peter made the point, the humans are the species of concern, shared with lots of other disciplines. We don't have to pick on just economics for that. Environment is seen as a resource. Technology largely is seen as sort of monotonic progress. Um, manna from heaven, especially in very influential models like the economics of climate change. The marginal change is the unit of analysis, so don't worry about your irreversible thresholds or uncertainty because it's always just the next little step that we're worried about. You know all of this from reading, hopefully, in ecological economics, the primacy of efficiency. Distribution is a given in economic analysis, right? That's the starting point. You're given a distribution and then you go on and find the most efficient outcomes. There's a very strong implicit assumption of substitutability between inputs, especially technology for nature. Uh, a, a, a huge drive on the conditions for equilibrium, as Herman Daly has said that e economics is model itself after classical physics, after the mathematics of physics, but not the content of physics. Um, and progress in general is seen as determin d deterministic. And again, we share this with many other disciplines in the social sciences and humanities. Um, so we've built a somewhat contrasting worldview, but we kind of hang on to components of this, maybe to our demise. Um, ecological economics certainly shows much promise, um, but I think it's a kind of promise where we need to constantly revisit the sort of essential questions of ecological economics. I get so many students, especially undergrads, who come 
to take ecological economics at the University of Vermont. And from their perspective, ecological economics started in 1997 with the Nature article published by Costanza and colleagues. Um, and ecological economics is about the value, valuing, economic value of the world. Um, we have a rich, rich tradition that builds from the moral imperative of, of economics from the classical era, the physicality of production, systems theory from Boulding, Odom, Forrester, and Meadows, and macroeconomic money and trade and, and the trade critique. And we owe a lot of debt to people like Herman Daly who brought all of this together kind of under one umbrella that today we celebrate at a meeting like this called Ecological Economics. It points to a different worldview. It points to this reconciliation project that Peter referred to. It, it points to an economic worldview where humans at least are part of a whole. Certainly, ecological economists, like any other of us in the social sciences, uh, humans are the species of concern. Um, that hasn't changed very far. Rather than environmentist resource, we, we really push for a worldview that the economy is the subsystem. This was stressed by Peter Victor last night. Technology as a social process with social goals and outcomes. Uh, moving more towards a contemporary science understanding of complexity and discontinuity. The primacy of scale. Efficiency is important, but scale and distribution are much, much more important. Distribution is a goal of the ecological worldview, not a given. Um, always and everywhere looking at the complementary of inputs, and particularly low entropy matter energy is complementary to everything we do in the economic process. You can do nothing without it. The reality of disequilibrium and of course a rich tradition within ecological economics of thinking about coevolutionary change and trying to sort of pull away from progress as deterministic. So there's much promise of ecological economics to sort of bring in an ecological worldview, a science worldview, an, a study of the economy built on the foundations of natural science. Um, my colleague and I, John Gowdy, is John here? I don't know if John's here. Um, we did a piece in the, the Ecological Economics Journal called Ecological Economics at a Crossroads uh, now 10 years ago. And we were asking this basic question, is ecological economics still ecological, right? <laughs> or have we sort of built an you know, economical ecology or something? Um, and 10 years later, we're kind of asking this question, you know, have we chose wisely? Which path did we take? And we presented sort of these two paths. And there's been a, a fair amount of literature since we wrote that article asking this question of ecological e economics and its future, the second generation. What's, what's wonderful about our journal of ecological economics is that it's not afraid to um, publish things that critique ecological economics. Um, does ecological economics have a future? This is one of the examples in looking at um, the distribution of articles on climate change in the journals and to what extent they build from mainstream ideas or critical ideas. Um, an article on the second generation of ecological economics, how far has the apple fallen from the tree, with a conclusion that it's drifted more towards what at least I was taught in grad school is environmental economics, and drifted more towards this pragmatic position that is now largely shared with environmental researchers at large. Right, the establishment of ecosystem monetary valuation as a pragmatic, I'm sorry, we have to play this game, we have to do this, this is how the world works. Um, so part of this project, Economics for the Anthropocene, is to question these foundations, question the evolution of the field, look to ecological economics as a, sort, a source of, of great wisdom and power to start to find these orphans' parents. <laughs> Uh, not only in economics, but finance, political science, um, law, ethics, philosophy. Um, if you will, usher in a renaissance in the social sciences and humanities that's akin to the renaissance that we saw in the sciences in the 1950s and 60s. And so some of this is looking back to some of those old foundations and old maps, and some of it is looking to new maps. And so towards an economics for the Anthropocene, some of the old maps are classical economics. You know, economists uh, didn't call themselves economists in the 1700s and 1800s. They called themselves philosophers. And they asked deeply, deeply 
important questions around the morality of, of what we do and our choices. Uh, Herman Daly's and, and John, John Cobb's book, For the Common Good, is certainly a good starting point for looking for a kind of modern mission that builds from the classical era to what the economy should be aspiring to, what you might call an ecological economics 1.0. The first journal of the first volume of ecological economics has much of this kind of old maps or foundations for the field. And then new maps, um, what I sometimes call borderland economics, where economists have purposefully worked with the natural sciences at various levels, fields like neuroeconomics, where economists are working with neurobiology to actually test the assumptions of utility. Behavioral economics, where economists are working with psychologists and working with the behavioral sciences to actually reveal that what are called behavioral anomalies in introductory textbooks are actually human nature. Um, evolutionary economics, institutional economics, there's a lot of kind of cross-fertilization parts of within the mainstream actually that are showing some, some fruitful maps for how to build an economics built on, partnered with, contemporary science. Evolutionary psychology, sociobiology, um, certainly in the 1970s and into the 80s, um, sociobiology took, took its uh, licks and lots of black eyes along the way, but held strong nonetheless to say that yes, the principles of science can be applied to humans, that humans don't stand at the top of the ladder of nature as, as distinct from everything else, but we are part of nature. We are the third chimpanzee. We are embedded in nature. We are part of the whole great chain of becoming. And big history, as Peter mentioned, provides us with a map and a cosmological narrative that I think is very important for social sciences and humanities more broadly to wrestle with. So as we move towards an economics for the Anthropocene, we find that it's not just ecological economics, but the field of economics is really at a crossroads. It's, it's, it's a field that has much prominence and much um, uh, influence within higher education. Um, and we either sort of roll up our sleeves and, and change that and, and, and really embed the whole enterprise of economics within the sciences, we treat economics as a life science, which Herman Daly called for in 1968. Or we say, yeah, ecological economics will be this sort of elective that some students in environmental studies programs can take and, and as I did, be very schizophrenic in their studies. Like, <laughs> I took ecology and it says the world works like this and I took economic, what do I do? Um, I was lucky to stumble upon daily steady state economics in a free book pile which helped me figure things out. Economics can be a helpful servant, but makes a terrible master. Um, I think, and maybe some of my colleagues in economics um, uh, who suffer as I have superiority complex will feel that this is a bad, a bad way to phrase it, but I think economics and economists can be very good technicians, but as master planners, um, we need to knock ourselves off the, the the pedestal. Ecological economics shows some potential for embedding the economy in society and ecosystem, but is in danger of itself of being captured by this economic worldview writ large. And I think that's an important um, theme for us to wrestle with at this meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>